So today we have uh, Sophia Hermans uh, presenting her work on uh, qubit teleportation between non-neighboring nodes in a quantum network. And Sophia did her studies uh, here in Delft in applied physics. Uh, and she joined Von Hansen's lab first as a master student in uh, 2017. And then in 2018, she continued as a PhD student. Uh, uh, so by, by simple subtraction, she now been a PhD student for three years. So in the lab and has worked on multi-node quantum networks using uh, NV centers. And uh, besides being a, a PhD student, she's also uh, one of the QTech speakers uh, giving talks to everybody from uh, high schools to tech interested people in general. Uh, and she's also one of the so called uh, faces of science, pointed by the Royal Netherlands Academy of Arts and Sciences. So, with that, uh, welcome, Sophia. And uh, we are looking forward to hear about your recent results. And finally, I will also say uh, if you have questions, feel free to ask during the talk, uh, raise your hand. We take it as we go. Yeah, or even unmute yourself and start talking. That's also fine. <laughs> uh, yeah, thank you for the uh, nice introduction, Christian. And also, thank you very much, uh, Grazia, as well, for uh, organizing this 360 seminar. I think it's really nice to show from the various groups to each other what, what we do, what we actually do. Uh, so before I want to dive into like the full experimental part of my talk, I would actually like to start with a bit of a thought experiment. So uh, let's imagine that you are an experimentalist in the lab or a physicist in the lab, and you have two nodes. And on these nodes, you have a communication qubit and a memory qubit. And these two nodes share an entangled pair of uh, qubits. And you have an extra arbitrary uh, qubit state. Okay, this is something, uh, at least to me, is not super fancy anymore in the lab, but uh, you can write it in this mathematical way like this. Okay, that is maybe interesting, maybe not. But then if you start to write out uh, the state, so for instance, we work out this tensor product, then uh, we get something that is, uh, yeah, still not very interesting, I would say. And then we can write it out even more, and then you just get a bigger expression. But then we can write it out even more when we use a certain trick. So what if we now rewrite certain terms of this expression in a, a combination of Bell states? What happens then? Still not so interesting, just a very, very long expression. But then if we start to group these terms together, we actually see something interesting appearing. So what we now have is if, if we write our two qubits on one node in a Bell basis, we can write the other uh, state on the, on the second node uh, separately, or at least in a combination of these. And then we start to see, we start to recognize this arbitrary state here on the left side, but now on the right side. And if it, even if we simplify this a little bit more, we see that we exactly get the arbitrary state that we have on the left side, but then on the right side up to a certain rotation, depending on in which Bell state these two qubits on the left side would be. So what does this mean? This means actually that if we could measure the two qubits on the left side in a Bell basis, and that means that we project the qubit on the right into this arbitrary uh, qubit state with, that we used to have on the left side up to a certain rotation. And this is the concept of teleportation. I find this one of the most fascinating parts of uh, quantum physics because just from the notion of a superposition, entanglement, and projective measurements, you can teleport a state from one side to another side. And then I said that there was a thought experiment, but this thought experiment is actually only exactly 28 years ago being thought of or being discovered. And I think 28, is, 28 years is not that long ago. So 
this is to me one of the most surprising uh, things also in quantum physics. Uh, and not only did people uh, thought of this as a thought experiment, also whenever this was, uh, when this was published, like this 28 years ago, people also soon, very soon started to see, okay, can we do this actually experimentally in the lab? So in the late 90s, people started to uh, perform this experiment in, in the lab. And that they also, they also saw that in this way, they can teleport information from one side to the other side. So as long as you can do a bell state measurement on the left side, and you communicate the outcomes of these bell state measurements to the right, and you can perform this operation on the right side, you can reconstruct or obtain this arbitrary qubit state. And this not only means that uh, you have transferred information from one side to the other, but also that it didn't have to travel through any link. So really, as in the science fiction, it's really science, the teleportation means that on one side your information disappears, where on the other side your information appears. So not only did people do this in the late 90s with photons, actually also in the last 10 years, people have done this with matter qubits. So where they formed an entangled pair between distant uh, qubits, distant matter qubits, and then actually did this teleportation step. So in various platforms, this has been performed from trapped ions trapped atoms, atomic ensembles, but also here in Delft with NV centers in diamond. So this is all very cool. And people also very soon started to realize that this is not only useful to show the coolness of physics, but actually also that you can use this in quantum networks. Since, as I said, this information doesn't have to travel through any, any connection, there's no loss that can occur in the transfer of this uh, quantum information or this piece of quantum information. So actually this can be a very useful building block for quantum networks. It means that you can transfer information from distant nodes without having to suffer from the loss between the, between the nodes. Uh, so that's also a motivation for these two node experiments that has been, have been performed. But as I said, all these experiments were between two nodes, so directly neighboring nodes. Now, if you want to start using this in networks, as a large part of us is working in the quantum internet and network uh, division of QTech, we don't want to do so much this as a two-node experiment, which had, has been done up to now, but we really want to do it, take it a step further. So as I said, all these experiments were nearest neighbor experiments. And what we want now to show is in a network setting, can we also perform teleportation of quantum information between distant nodes that are not necessarily directly connected? So really, can we do teleportation in a quantum network? Well, then, uh, as you have probably uh, heard recently, we have uh, uh, built this quantum network here in the lab. So we have our three nodes, Alice, Bob, and Charlie. And they each have a communication qubit that we can use to make entanglement between the, dis the distant nodes. And also Bob and Charlie contain a memory qubit where they can store quantum states. So uh, 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 earlier this year, we have pub published our result about, this, uh, uh, about our quantum network. And in this quantum network, we actually did it make this entangled pair of qubits of two nodes that don't share a direct connection. So in this case, between Alice and Charlie. And we managed to make a, a five plus bell state. Um, and then by doing the, the bell state measurement on Bob to teleport the uh, uh, entangled state to Alice and Charlie, we have obtained a fidelity which shows that this is purely or really a, a quantum state and it cannot be made with a just a classical uh, picture. However, since this was also the first uh, realization of this quantum network and the first generation of these states, this experiment was rather slow. So this was roughly, we got a state every three minutes. So now what we want to do is we want to take this research one step further and not only make this entangled state between Alice and Charlie, but actually consume it for the teleportation. So what we, what we call then this uh, entangled state between them, this EPR pair or this bell state between Alice and Charlie, 
That is our teleporter. And then we want to use this teleporter to, in this case, teleport the quantum bit or a qubit from Charlie to Alice. Now, unfortunately, um, this rate, the, the rate of this experiment is quite slow. So we need to get some improvements to both boost the fidelity, such that we can sh show again that this is purely a, a classic a quantum experiment, and also do it with a rate that makes it practically feasible in the lab. And that's actually what I want to show you today. So a bit more uh, of an outline of, of the talk. So first I will walk you through the different steps of the experiment that we have performed. And then I will present you our three key innovations that we have done on our quantum network to really make sure that this uh, new experiment of teleportation of a qubit across the network or between the non neighboring nodes would be possible. And one is this tailored heralding for a two node experiment. We have extended our memory qubit coherence uh, we um, implemented a basis alternating repetitive readout of the memory qubit. And then together with this, I will explain all what all these words mean. Uh, and then with this, we have managed to do the teleportation experiment. I will show you the results of our experiment. And in the end, I will give you a bit of an, uh, a summary, but also an outlook of what the, the, the next steps of this research will be. So first of all, about the, the experiment. Since it contains quite some steps, I thought it would be nice to go uh, through it step by step. Already during the pitch, I flashed you like this uh, enormous gate circuit. I won't. Uh, I will simplify it a bit, but at least that you know step by step uh, what this experiment is about. So as I said, we have our quantum network consisting of three nodes: Alice, Bob, and Charlie, and then we're then. Uh, Alice is connected to Bob, and also Bob has a connection to Charlie. Now, what we do is actually we have three phases of the experiment. We have the phase where we generate the teleporter, so this entangled pair of qubits between the two non-neighboring nodes. Once we have heralded this, or we know that this has, uh, has been established, we can prepare the state we want to teleport. And then finally, we perform the teleportation by measuring in this bell state basis, by measuring a, be a, a, a bell state measurement on Charlie in this case. So in step one, to generate the teleporter, that's actually one of the most tricky things of this experiment. So what we do actually is we start by making a two node entangled state between Alice and Bob with their communication qubits. Then once we have heralded this, so this is a probabilistic uh, process, but we know when it has succeeded. Whenever this has succeeded, we swap or store this entangled state on Bob on the nuclear spin. So we swap it. And then we have freed up our communica communi communication qubit to establish a second entangled link. So in this case, between Bob and Charlie. And again, this is a probabilistic process. And then once this step has, uh, has worked, we perform our first bell state measurement in the experiment, in this case on Bob, and we communicate the outcomes to Charlie. And then we do this, and then we get the entangled state between Alice and Charlie, so the non-neighboring nodes. And then again, we store this state on the memory qubits. And at this point, the teleporter is ready. Now to teleport then a state, we initialize the communication qubits again. We prepare a state that we want to teleport on this communication qubit. So in this case, uh, state psi. And then we have prepared the state to be teleported. Then we go to the third phase of the experiment, and that is the teleportation itself. So now we have the teleporter ready. We have the state that we want to teleport ready. So then we can perform again a bell state measurement on these two qubits, communicate the outcomes of the bell state measurement to Alice, and then Alice can reconstruct or obtain the state psi. And then we have teleported the state really between the non neighboring mm -hmm. nodes. So this is uh, quite some steps. And actually the key innovations that, we, that I will present actually act on various parts of the experiment. 
So the tailored heralding for the two node entanglement actually uh, improves the uh, two node entangled states we generate between Alice and Bob, but also the one we generate between Bob and Charlie. Then, as I said, during this uh, um, generation of the two node entangled state, we swap our um, entangled state to the memory qubit of Bob. And then while we have this state on Bob, we generate a second state. But actually here, it is quite hard to maintain your first entangled state on the memory qubit. The, oh, the more often you attempt to make this uh, uh, entanglement, the more your memory qubit, which stores the first entangled state will be coherent. But during this research or to, to make this possible, we have extended this memory coherence. And the last thing is actually in the two bell shape measurements that we do, we have to read out both the communication qubit and the memory qubit, and we have improved the way that we read out the memory qubit. Uh, so this is the, the basic overview of, uh, of the experiment. And now I will go over one by one what then these improvements and what the system actually looks like. We will go through that uh, completely. Um, and then uh, later on, I will show you the, the outcomes of the experiment. But please let me emphasize, as soon as there is a question, just let me know. Uh, so let's go over these key innovations step by step. So let's go into the tailored heralding for the two node entanglement. And for that, I first want to introduce you a little bit more into our qubit system. So as Christian already said in the introduction, I work with uh, nitrogen vacancy centers in diamonds. So that means that we have a diamond sample with their a defect where one of the carbon atoms is replaced by a nitrogen atom and the other uh, carbon atom is uh, uh, just knocked out and has, a, uh, has left a vacancy. And at this spot, we can trap an extra electron and then the combination of electrons that exist there or that they localize there that we can use as our qubit. So that's an electronic spin uh, actually a spin one system. And if we look at the ground state of this uh, spin one system, we see the three uh, spin states. So the M is zero and plus and minus one. Uh, and we use a magnetic field to split the plus and minus uh, spin states such that we can use really two of the three as our qubit uh, subsystem or as our qubit sublab. Um, and then if we look a bit more on the level structure of this defect, we see that in the ground state, we can use microwaves to drive uh, between the, the two qubit levels. So we either use zero, uh, we either use plus or minus one, and we always do zero. And we can use microwave pulses to make any superposition between the states. And that's not the only levels that we're interested in. We can actually also selectively excite the ground state spin levels to an excited state using lasers. So that's why uh, we work in the optics in a laser lab. Uh, and then we, we use the transition from zero to the excited state as our readout or entanglement tra uh, transition. And actually we use the other transition from the plus or minus one state to the excited state as an uh, initialization transition. So that means if we keep on driving this transition, up until the point where uh, roughly all population has flipped to the other state and got trapped there because we don't address that state with the laser. And then our readout process works roughly similar. We park our laser at this frequency. We selectively excite any population that is in zero. And if we then measure a photon, we know that our qubit was in zero. And if we don't measure a photon, we know that our qubit was in plus or minus one. And there's one more important thing that you need to know about the NV center, and that's on the uh, photon emission from the excited state. So actually, uh, whenever we want to make entanglement use, want to make entanglement using these photons, we can actually only use resonantly emitted photons. Because in the case that it would also have emitted a phonon next to it, so the phonon sideband photons, then actually this phonon also carries information about our uh, spin uh, state of the defect. So those we cannot use for, for our entanglement generation, but we can use it to, to read out our state. 
But the fact that only two and a half percent or two and a half to three percent is being emitted in this zero phone online actually heavily reduces the rate at which we can make entanglement. Uh, you will see later why I also explained uh, uh, the phonal sideband because it comes into play later on. So that's about the communication qubit, uh, our central qubit uh, in the whole protocol. Now a bit on how do we now make remote entanglement? Well, therefore we need, of course, two nodes. So in this case, in this example, we have Alice and Bob, and we can initialize them in a superposition of the zero state that we can address with the uh, entanglement laser and the, and the one state, which we call in this case a dark state. And then this uh, parameter alpha determines how much of the population is in the bright zero state. And then we excite it with our uh, excitation laser part with the readout transition, and then we can make a spin photon entangled state. Then if we do this on both sides, and we measure one photon directly after a beam splitter, so after a half transparent mirror. And in that case, we don't know anymore where the photon came from. And then measuring this photon actually projects us in an entangled state or in actually the state row that I described here. So part of it is purely a, 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 a psi plus or minus bell state, but there's also a noise term in the, um, in the presence of that they were both in the bright state, but, but we lost one of the photons. Um, and then this is the, the entangled state that rolls out. And then if we start to vary this uh, bright state population um, parameter alpha, we can actually see that we can trade uh, fidelity for rate. So the higher fidelity state we want to make, the slower the process will be. Um, now, so as you can see, this is not a perfect entangled state, and part of it comes from uh, the error in the protocol, but we actually know that there are some more uh, errors that we make. So the main, uh, the main error sources we have in this entanglement pro uh, protocol is, first of all, the protocol error, so that the fact that they were both in the bright state and have emitted the photon, but we lost one along the way. Uh, then there's a phase instability. For this protocol, you need to stabilize the phase of an effective interferometer to make sure that we always generate the same uh, entangled state with the same phase, but we can make errors in this. Uh, if you want to know more about this, then I would for sure recommend to read our three-note paper. There it's, uh, uh, it's extensively discussed. Then there are uh, two other uh, error sources. One is a double excitation. So as I said, we make this uh, spin photon entangled state by using an optical excitation. And ideally, we use a short optical pulse, such that we get a sp uh, the spin state entangled with the presence of a single photon. But this optical pulse is more short. <laughs> so the lifetime of our uh, emitter is roughly 12 nanoseconds. And the full width half maximum of this pulse is roughly two nanoseconds. So they are on the same uh, time scales roughly. So the probability that you can get actually a second photon or that you get re-excited after you have decayed is not negligible. And it means that actually we can have uh, that the spin state is actually entangled with two photons. So that's one big error source that we, that we know happens in our system. And the other one is uh, finite distinguishability of the photons. So ideally, after the beam splitter or after the half transparent mirror, you don't know from which side the photon came. Uh, and you can establish that in the case that uh, the photons are purely indistinguishable. But that's actually not the case. So we know that for the NV center, we have some spectral diffusion which means that they that their uh, the frequency at in which it emits photons can drift slightly uh, in time or is uh, slightly different every time we excite the uh, NV center so that can introduce a frequency difference between the two emitters and what we actually know is that 
if there's a frequency difference between the emitters, it depends on when the photon uh, has arrived at the detector, uh, what then the fidelity of your entangled state is. So the later the photon arrived, the lower the fidelity of your entangled state would be. And this uh, comes to the uh, is due to the fact of how much time your emitter has spent in the excited state, and then also if there is a frequency difference in how much time you have allowed the system to get uh, out of phase with each other. Um, but now in this experiment, we have tried to combat uh, a few of these uh, uh, errors that we make, because for instance, the the uh, entanglement protocol error and the double excitation, they are actually uh, both happening with the emittance of two photons. And what we want to try is to see if we can catch some of these second photons. The phase instability, unfortunately, we cannot do so much about it, but that we have already uh, engineered. And in the case of the finite distinguishability of the photons, we can see if we can work with the shorter detection window. So to go a bit more into our tailored heralding, what we do is actually, instead of that we only look at our zero phonon line detectors after the beam splitter, we actually also make use of our phonon sideband detectors. So normally we split off the ZPL photons to use for entanglement generation from the photons that we cannot use for entanglement generation, but we use those for readout. But what we now can do is actually also look at these detectors uh, during the act of entanglement generation. So remember, actually, the biggest part of the photons that are being emitted actually end up in these phonal sideband detectors. And then now what we do, actually, in the case that we have two photons, we know that something went wrong in our protocol. So either it was that both and V centers were in the zero state and have emitted the photon, or one of the two has actually emitted two photons. So we don't know which error has occurred, but we know a error has occurred. And those uh, events we can actually real time reject. So normally we would herald our entangled state on the GPL detectors, but we actually only accept this heralding if none of the PSB detectors. Uh, has also detected a photo. And to uh, sort of characterize what this would do for our uh, protocol, we actually look at, this, at exactly these events. So where we now have measured two entangled photons. And if we then look at the uh, uh, Z correlations or the classical correlations, we see something interesting happening. So uh, if you look at this, uh, histogram of the phonal sideband of Alice, we can clearly see two regimes. We have a sort of an early regime, which we know has, uh, is happening during the optical excitation of the pulse, and we have a regime afterwards. So that's the, the yellow part. And if we look at events where we got a, so where we both got the ZPL photon and the PSB photon, but then in the early regime, we actually see that there is one of the outcomes most probable, namely that in this case, Alice was in the bright state and Bob was in the dark state. And this indicates that actually both photons have come from Alice, so that we have made the double excitation error. But now, if we start looking at the photons that were emitted after the pulse, so in this re yellow regime, we see that now all of a sudden this zero zero contribution or the zero zero measurement outcome was most probable, indicating that we have made this uh, double bright state or double zero state error, where actually both NV centers have emitted the photon. So this is in the case that we have detected the second photon on Alice's side, but then if we look on uh, Bob's uh, detection events, we see that these correlations in the case of during the pulse flip, so that we now see that Bob has emitted both of the photons, but again, after the pause, we see again that this zero, zero outcome is most probable, indicating again that they have both emitted the photon. 
So this would, we can use real life, uh, real time in our uh, experiment. And then together with shrinking our detection window, we can uh, improve our fidelities a bit. And then the improvement is actually governed by the occurrence of this error, but also the detection efficiency of the funnel sideband detectors or this entire path, which is around 10%. So if we then look at the improvement, we see that we, uh, in the case that we start filtering on these phonon sideband uh, detections, we improve by roughly uh, half percent to a percent. But if we then also start shrinking our detection window on the ZPL, we can win even a bit more. And we win per entangled state roughly a percent. So this doesn't sound like a lot, but actually this influences uh, our final teleporter state. So the entangled state between Alice and Charlie quite a bit because they both end up in there. And there we actually see that we win roughly uh, from simulations, we expect that we win roughly 3%, which is uh, if you know that you're quite close to the bound of uh, showing teleportation in the end, was a very welcome improvement. So this is uh, our uh, part about uh, the tailored heraldic. Now I would like to continue to our next improvement. And that's this extended memory qubit coherence. Uh, so a little bit about the memory qubits. So as I said, we use the electron spin of the nitrogen vacancy center as our communication qubit, but we can actually use nearby uh, carbon-13 isotopes as our um, uh, memory qubits. And then we, can, we cannot control those directly in our setups. The only way that we can control those qubits is actually via the um, via the via the electron spin, and then actually by changing the the, uh, the spin state of the uh, communication qubit, we change the uh, Lamour precession frequency of the uh, memory qubits, and then by doing this in a tailored and uh, uh, time uh, time precise uh, method, we can control these memory qubits. And we are not the only ones uh, who look for these uh, uh, memory qubits. Actually, in a group of Tim, as you all know, they've done also amazing uh, experiments with these. Uh, but then, as I said, the challenging part is actually, so this interaction is actually always there. You cannot really easily turn it off. And that's actually a challenging part during entanglement generation. So if you look a bit closer on, like on pulse level, what then an entanglement attempt looks like is first uh, initialization of the communication qubit. Then we make the superposition state. Then we excite to make the spin photon entangled state. And then we apply another microwave pulse. Um, and in the past, we have seen that um, the memory qubit would roughly survive uh, 400 attempts before it's quantum state would completely have decohered. So fortunately, Norbert, the PhD student uh, uh, who was involved in this work, has also um, proposed a solution. Actually, if you would go to a higher magnetic field, then this memory qubit coherence would greatly improve. And that's actually something that we have seen in our uh, most recent work of the, the quantum network. There we have gone up from roughly 400 attempts that we put uh, survive with our quantum states to roughly 2,000, a little bit less than 2,000 attempts, which was already a great improvement for the work there. But again, if we can extend it even more, that means that we can also win in this experiment. But one other observation that we, that we made here is actually, if we look at um, the memory coherence in the, the fact where we do or we do not do entanglement attempts or where we just idle, are roughly similar. And that would indicate that actually most of the coherence is not coming from the entanglement attempt itself, but actually just from um, intrinsic defacing of the, the memory qubit or interactions with the, with the bath, unwanted interactions with the bath. And if we would then decouple the memory qubit uh, from that, we can actually again win a lot in our memory qubit coherence. So that's what we did. We extended. Uh, our entanglement attempts uh, slightly. So what we now do is we take our entanglement attempts and during that time we have a, a quantum state stored on our memory qubits. 
Then we perform a, uh, a decoupling pi uh, pulse on the memory qubit. Then we wait for the same amount of time as it took to generate entanglement to rephase our, our uh, uh, memory qubit. And then we read out our memory qubit. Um, and what we then see is that we can actually go from these 2,000 attempts that I showed you before to almost or even more than 5,000 attempts we can survive. So this is again a big improvement to make this experiment work at in like feasible time scales because it means that we can try for 5,000, uh, well not in this case 5,000 attempts, we have set the threshold to 1,000, we can try for 1,000 attempts to generate entanglement and if it has not succeeded within the timeout, we start over. Uh, but this means that we can win, win a lot in rate. And actually, I showed you this diagram. It was not as simple as uh, doing this, because for instance, already this pulse, we cannot apply directly on the memory qubit. All these uh, um, steps that we do, we actually have to do via the communication qubit. So it was a little bit more to implement than just this uh, diagram but it has uh, really paid off. So then I want to go to the third improvement that we have made. And that's this basis alternating repetitive uh, readout of the memory qubit. So during the bell shape measurements, we read out both the communication qubits and the memory qubit to find out in what bell state they were projected into, or uh, they were projected. But then again, we cannot measure the memory qubit directly. We actually do this via the communication qubit. So uh, using our gate uh, schemes, we actually use a such a scheme to read out the memory qubit. We map its state to the communication qubit and then read out the communication qubit. And then the way that we read out the communication qubit is that we park our laser at the readout of the uh, at the transition of the, the, the readouts or from the zero to the excited state. And then if we measure a photon, we knew that the a memory qubit and therefore the, uh, the communication qubit and therefore the memory qubit wasn't zero, or if we didn't attack the photon, it would be in the opposite state. Uh, but this has some downsides, especially from the side of the, the communication qubit, because this is a, a cycling transition but again, also not a perfect cycling transition. So it could happen that actually we excite, but that the spin state, uh, either in the uh, uh, excited state or via a singlet state, flips to the other ground state. So that means that we cannot read out forever. And if we don't detect the photon before our spin state has flipped, we actually lost and we get the wrong outcome. So this is a big readout error. So this was already uh, like 10 years ago when we introduced this method, already seen as the, the limiting part of this readout scheme. So you see that the longer you make your uh, readout time, at some, point, at some point, your fidelity of your readout just saturates. So therefore, uh, we can use another trick, and that is this basis alternating repetitive readout. And in this case, we don't map our uh, state once to the communication qubit, but we do that in a repeated fashion. And actually we do that in an alternating fashion because we know on the communication qubit, our readout fidelities are very asymmetric in this case. Um, and then if we look at the, the results of this scheme, what we do actually is we measure for a certain number of times, and then the first readout assigns the readout outcome, but then we only accept the result if the other remaining readouts were consistent. So now in this case, we can have three outcomes, namely one, uh, the, the qubit is in zero, the qubit is in one, or we get no outcome. So if we look at the readout fidelities of each single block, we see that indeed we have asymmetric uh, readout fidelities due to this optical readout of the communication qubit, but also that our uh, readout scheme um, doesn't introduce many errors. We only see a slow decay once we start to increase the number of readouts. So this is a good sign if you want to implement our uh, basis alternating repetitive readout. So that's what you see in the middle plot. 
So for the first, it's not really a repetitive readout, but then as we start to incorporate more of the readouts, we actually see our uh, readout fidelity shooting up and that they actually also become symmetric. Um, and then if we look at in how many of the cases we got actually an answer out of this readout scheme, we also see that this number is going up the more readouts you introduce, because then you have a bigger probability of getting an inconsistent pattern. Um, so actually to make a good trade-off between how many outcomes we get and what the fidelity of the readout is, we actually already see from these plots that at two readouts, only performing two readouts would give us an uh, optimum um, or a good trade-off between high readout fidelity and that we uh, get uh, most of the times an answer. So this is our uh, third improvement and it, it will help in the, in the bell state measurement that we can trust or uh, uh, have a higher confidence in more readout patterns of the bell state measurement. Okay, so those are the three improvements that we have done. If we then can look at the results of our uh, teleportation experiment. Uh, so we have uh, incorporated this all and then we can uh, see what the results are. And then what we want to study is actually um, the average uh, um, fidelity of a state that we teleport. And also to make sure that we don't bias ourselves, we measure in the three cardinal states and then in both uh, directions. So the six, we in total, we measure six different states. And um, in this case, what we actually do for each of the bell state measurements, so we have two in our protocol, one on Bob to uh, make the entangled state between Alice and Charlie, and on Charlie to actually teleport the state to Alice. And what we do is we actually accept only two out of the four patterns as an outcome. So in the case uh, that we measured zero on the communication qubit and zero or one on the um, memory qubit. And in this way, we have tweaked our measurement, uh, our readout scheme to the ones where we have highest confidence that we got the right results. So we implemented also the bar readout for this reason. And we have an in-sequence uh, check that actually the nitrogen vacancy center was in the right charge state, namely NV minus. And with that, we got uh, these results showing that we have statistically uh, measured above the classical bound, indicating that we have performed this experiment really that could only be done with the quantum nature of the, of the protocol. So this is really the first teleportation between non-neighboring nodes in any system. And then we can look into the results a little bit better. As I said, these bell state measurements are, are uh, crucial. And we can actually look at the uh, dependence on the bell state me uh, measurement on Charlie, what then the uh, teleported state fidelities would be for the different uh, bell states. And what we also do as a, uh, uh, what you can see here is actually that the, the gray lines are simulated values, is that indeed, uh, as expected, the um, dependence of um, the memory qubit uh, is actually not present anymore due, due to this basis alternating repetitive readout. And as an extra check, we also compute our results in the case that we would not um, communicate the results of the bell state measurement to Alice to reconstruct the state to show that we didn't have any bias in our experiments. This is pure as a check that our results are not biased. Uh, so this is already one important result, but we can also take it one step further. So what we did here up to now is basically we have prepared the teleporter and then we prepare the uh, state that we want to teleport. And then we do the bell state measurement, but we only accept certain outcomes of the bell state measurement. But in many applications, what you actually want is uh, the case that as soon as you have prepared your state, that you want to have it guaranteed that it ends up on the other side. So that there is no restriction on the bell state measurement. And that you, in this case, you have actually um, 
a unit or 100% efficiency of that your state ends up on the other side, that no, nowhere in the sequence your sequence is aborted. So this is what we call unconditional teleportation. So every state prepared at the sender side ends up at the receiver side. So here we dropped all the restrictions about the bell state measurement on Charlie, and we continue in all cases. And what we then can see is that indeed our teleported state fidelity drops as expected. But then in principle, if you want to really do it in an unconditional manner, this teleportation protocol, then we can use the trick where we actually shrink the detection window in the two node entanglement generation steps. And in that way, we can again win a bit in uh, infidelity and still showing that it can be significantly teleported in an unconditional manner above the uh, classical bound. Uh, so this brings me um, uh, to almost the end of uh, my talk. So I want to quickly give you an uh, outlook for like, future uh, research we want to do in our lab. So one other thing that this uh, ties into also the importance on, of unconditional teleportation is deterministic teleportation. So in this case, we have first prepared the teleporter and then the state we want to teleport. But in many applications, this, this is actually, or this doesn't scale in a favorable way. And in many uh, applications, you would actually want to do deterministic teleportation, which means that you first create or receive or at any, uh, in, with any means acquire uh, your quantum state that you want to teleport and only then start to prepare your teleporter and then perform the um, bell state measurement. So this is called deterministic teleportation. And actually with the improvements we have done on the memory qubit coherence, this comes almost up to a point where we can do this experiment. Or yeah. Uh, another thing that we want to do in our lab is um, making more abstraction in our uh, software. So at the moment, our software is uh, highly dedicated or made by ourselves to work really with the NV setups. But we want to move towards more hardware agnostic software, such that we can also sh show it with the same software or you can run the same application actually on, on different platforms as well. And in our lab, we also are exploring uh, different defects, in uh, particular the tin vacancy center in diamond to really boost these entanglement rates. So as I showed you, the, this zero phone online contribution heavily uh, limits, or the fact that the zero phone online contribution is so small heavily limits our entanglement rates. And if we can go to a different defect that we can either incorporate into a cavity or that already emits by itself more in the zero phone online, we can heavily boost our entanglement rates. So these are like future uh, steps for our, our research in our lab. So that brings me uh, to my summary. What I've shown you in the last uh, 15 minutes, are, uh, I showed you what types of, uh, what experiment we did, what the different steps were. I, throw, I showed you uh, our three key innovations. So this tailored heralding of the entangled states, uh, the extended memory coherence and this repetitive readout. Uh, and actually these innovations are not specific to the NV center. So they, uh, they use some of the properties of the NV center, but they could also right away be implemented on different types of uh, emitters or qubit systems used for uh, remote entanglement. And then using all these uh, innovations, we have actually really showed for the first time a teleportation between non-neighboring nodes in a network. And with this, I would like to thank everybody who has uh, contributed to this research. And at the moment, I cannot uh, yet show you a reference where you can read more because we are working on the publications. Uh, but for now, I would really like to thank uh, the co-authors, but also you for attending this presentation. Great, thank you, uh, Sophia. Let's uh, all give uh, an applause. Uh, is there any questions from the audience? Maybe I can uh, then start off. Uh, so one thing that I was wondering uh, is that when you do this repetitive uh, 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 attempts to create the entanglement, right, you have these N and you say you can go up to a thousand and you sometimes uh, 
cancel the procedure because you get these uh, zero, uh, uh, sorry, you don't get the zero phonon line width, meaning you create phonons in your system. Yeah. Uh, does that cause an, an issue that you essentially generate up to, let's say, a thousand phonons in the system before you get entanglement in the sense that, um, or maybe to say it differently, if, is the fidelity of your entanglement better if it comes out in the beginning of this thousand attempts compared to the end? So the two node entanglement itself actually doesn't depend at all on which, uh, su uh, which attempt has succeeded. But it's purely if in the case that you have stored a state on your memory qubit, that then the more attempts you do, the more this memory qubit gets decohered. So for a two-node experiment, the answer is no. It doesn't matter when your entanglement succeeds. But if you uh, want to do more than a two-node experiment or something with the state stored on the memory qubit, then yes. Then the earlier on you have received your heralding signal for the entanglement, the less decoherent your memory qubit has experienced. OK, yeah, makes sense. Uh, then from chat, there's a question from Bob, who asks, uh, why do you need Bob? Uh, in the sense, uh, can you do the different steps directly on Charlie and Alice? Okay, so Charlie and uh, Alice actually don't share any uh, quantum channel in this sense. Like they don't share an optical fiber such that they can generate entanglement between them. So in the lab, this is of course something that we have made, that like we have not made a connection between uh, Alice and Charlie. But you can imagine that for future experiments where the distances between the nodes are much larger than uh, with us in the lab, this is actually a, a building block of a, of a quantum repeater that you use a middle node to uh, generate an entangled state between the outer two nodes. Does that yes. answer uh, the question? I think that was clear, but let's see if uh, Bob has a follow-up. Uh, yes, he said so. Then uh, uh, Jan asks uh, why the y based states have uh, much lower fidelity uh, and why are they even below the classical limit? Um, I think you are referring to this plot. Yes, I think that's what he's doing. Yes. So actually, uh, we know that from like we have all these steps that we do before we can actually teleport. and these steps all uh, bring their noise uh, mechanisms with them. So they're either are um, uh, introducing noise from a, a depolarizing, uh, depolarizing noise or defacing noise. And if you then have noise sources that, as in a defacing type of noise, only act on two of the three bases, and we have different mappings throughout the system, that can actually make sure that at uh, this point, in our case, Y gets hit most by our uh, different noise mechanisms throughout the entire protocol, and uh, much more than in this case, X. So if you would look at the um, uh, at our final results in sort of a, a block sphere picture, then you would really see a sort of squished rugby ball on what fidelity or what uh, state we can still achieve at the, at the end of the protocol. So it really comes because of the different steps in our protocol that introduce noise in different ways. Could you, maybe as a follow-up for that, could you do then a type of, uh, let's say, poorly randomizing uh, to sort of even out uh, the state where you would uh, sort of mm. apply random poly pulses during the operation of the state and then revert them at the end to sort of... Uh, to to sort of smear them. out all the noise, all the noise over all the bases. Yes. Uh, I think you could uh, do something like that. I, I wouldn't uh, exactly know uh, why, why you would want to do this. I think what it shows is actually that the, the, the reason why we measure this is already um, to show that this is then gives a fidelity for an, for an arbitrary state. So if you would only measure, I think this exactly shows that you want to measure actually in all uh, six cardinal states to show that you're really, so this is really the worst state that you could teleport, so that you're not biased in any sense. Okay, yeah. Good. Then there's a question from uh, Feng Li. And, uh, he asks, uh, how do you, how, how do the bell state measurements between the electronic and the 
nuclear. Okay, so how do you do the bell state measurement between the electronic qubit and the nuclear? That's a good question. So what we actually do is we make use of these uh, uh, these gates that we can do on the memory qubit via the communication qubit, and there we actually entangle the memory qubit to the communication qubit or add it to the to to the larger entangled state, and then we measure both of the of the qubits. So it's first an entangling operation, and then we read out the two uh, qubits first, the communication qubit, and then we use the communication qubit to read out the memory qubits. Great. Maybe I have one other question. Uh, you have my voice? Yeah, yeah. go ahead. Uh, at one point in the talk, uh, you pointed at the um, spectral diffusion of DMB centers, right? Uh, so from, from someone who actually looks into the data, I wanted to know what do these line shapes in frequency domain like look like? Like are they like Gaussian? Uh, so this is a very interesting question. And this is also exactly that we're trying to measure uh, in like the upcoming weeks in the lab. So maybe we, uh, we can uh, talk about this again in like a few weeks, but maybe I can flash you one more result which yeah. hints already a bit. Uh, so in one of my backup slides, I have something um, which is not yet so refined and polished, but I think very interesting to look at. So here, what we did in this experiment here is actually we introduced on purpose a frequency difference between the two emitters. And then what we see is actually that the later we detect the photon, a different phase we measure. So if you look here on the on the top left, um, you see here on the y-axis is our entangled state phase, and then the x-axis indicates when we have detected the photon. And then depending on the frequency difference of the two emitters, this um, entangled state phase starts to change. Mm. So actually, uh, from the fact that you see that st the entangled state phase change, we know that there must be a frequency difference between them. Mm -hmm. And in this case, it's a fixed. But if you would have no uh, offset frequency difference between the two, but actually a distribution, then yeah. it means that you actually average over different lines of this plot. So then this plot the uh, would... Uh, the slope, any slope would vanish, but still you would see that the uh, that the fidelity goes down because you have a distinguishability between the photons. So this is something that we are very much interested in, uh, how this exactly works. Uh, and it's also something that indeed we want to really see what then these, these shapes are, because we actually know it, it cannot com be completely be a Gaussian because we perform some checks in the sequence which already cut out certain uh, like we do this charge resonance check exactly to check sort of how close we are to the uh, the target frequency. So in that way, we also cut out certain frequencies. So, but we don't know the shape exactly yet. Right. Thank you. Does that answer your question? Yeah, sure. Thank you. Yeah. Great. Uh, I think now it's also uh, um, five. Luck. We had some very good questions. Uh, thank you, Sophia, for giving a very nice presentation, some cool results. Uh, thank you, everybody, for joining. Uh, and uh, see you all again at the next uh, QTech 360 seminar.